The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Clara Bukina from South Africa um, on behalf of the Big Data Analytics and Transboundary Water Collaboration for Southern Africa, of which the Sustainable Water Program is a partner, and USGS, the US Geological Survey. And this is the final um, webinar that we do with USGS, and it's with Dr. Stan Leakey, who's going to talk to us about sustainability of groundwater use. Um, for now, you are all muted, just so that the presentation can run smoothly and we don't have any background noises. However, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation, and you can do so by using the questions tab on your control panel for the GoToWebinar. Um, or you can send, you can use the chat mode as well, or if you really have a pending question that you need to answer, ask immediately, you can um, just do a show of hands and, and raise your hands. So there's different ways in which we can interact with each other during the presentation. As I see questions and I work with, with Stan, we will sort of make time for um, you to ask the question directly. I just want to see what it is before I can give you the voice. Um, and then uh, we, otherwise we're going to have a discussion at the end. And if we have enough time, we can do both. Um, Stan, just so you're aware, a lot of us in South Africa are working on a load shedding right now. So if people um, have to disappear throughout the conversation, it's also probably because the electricity ran out. So um, without much further ado, uh, let me give the word to Stan. And uh, thank you for being here today. I know that we had to reschedule your presentation. And uh, so thank you for making yourself available again. And we all really looking forward to it. The floor is yours. Thank you. And, um, something called the water budget myth. So. Um, I had done some work in this area, although not recently, but um, I'm gonna present to you uh, some thoughts on this. Um, and um, let's see, I can get this to advance. Oh yeah, okay. So I wanna refer you to um, two publications that relate to sustainability of groundwater. Uh, the first is a USGS circular, uh, circular 1186, which you could just um, Google that USGS circular 1186, and it would take you to this report. Um, another is a, a journal article that, that Bill Alley and I did it's called the journey from safe yield to sustainability and um i've um sent clara a copy of that um that you'd be welcome to um take that and read it if you're inclined to do that and um a lot of the material that i got is from the in this presentation is from this journal article uh, so the first concept we have is safe yield, and that's a fairly old concept. Uh, Lee in 1915 said it's the quantity of water that can be pumped regularly and permanently without dangerous depletion of storage reserve. So fairly basic, it was oriented just towards making sure you don't deplete the aquifer, you still have water in the aquifer. And um, that was commonly set to, as the, um, the average annual recharge to the aquifer. So the thinking was that if you pump up to that amount, you're not gonna deplete the storage over the long term. And then later, people have expanded this concept to include uh, whether or not it was economically feasible to remove water after some point or um, not pumping to a point where you're degrading water quality or you're um, infringing on someone's existing water rights. Um, 
So this concept of safe yield has made it into a lot of the water laws in the United States. And I'm just going to give an example of Arizona. In 1980, uh, they passed um, it's called the Groundwater Management Act, which, um, oh, by the way, I live in Arizona, so that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, so they have some very heavily pumped areas. Can you see my arrow? Is that, if I point out things? Yes, we can see maybe, that. Uh, let's see, there might be a tool. Anyway, um, well, these large areas of Phoenix AMA, Pinal AMA, Tucson AMA, and then there's one at the very south, the Santa Cruz AMA. These are heavily regulated areas. And um, under the Groundwater Management Act of 1980, um, these AMAs, at least most of them, were uh, it was decreed that they would be in a state of safe yield by the year 2025. So that was 40 years after this law passed. And we're coming up on that uh, safe yield date um, here pretty quickly. Um, and I don't think most of them will be, but they define safe yield as the condition when no more groundwater is being withdrawn than is being replaced annually. So that included both um, natural recharge to these aquifers and um, other kind of recharge that might be from imported surface water. For instance, when they apply it to the crops, uh, they bring it in from the Colorado River or something like that and apply it to the crops. So anyway, um, um, that's an example of safe yield, you know, making its way into water law. And I think other states have it as well. Um, now, sustainability, uh, you folks probably know so much or more about that than I do, but one um, definition is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs uh, from the Brundtland Commission. Um, and in that circular on groundwater sustainability I had on the second slide, um, the USGS defined groundwater sustainability as development and use of groundwater in a manner that can be maintained for an indefinite period without causing unacceptable environmental, economic, or social consequences. And um, this is interesting because it kind of has this social aspect to it. It's not purely, you know, from a scientific point of view, but what what effects of groundwater development will society uh, tolerate, or what is acceptable to society? So it's um, fairly broad in that that regard. Um, now I'm going to talk a lot about some of the negative aspects of uh, groundwater development. But I, I first want to just mention that kind of the positive aspects, and that is that this groundwater is just a tremendous resource. Uh, we use it for so much domestic and public supply, agriculture, industry, mining, and um, it has some really important spatial and temporal, temporal advantages. It's, um, 
it will provide water for us where we don't have surface water, so it allows us to live in areas that we would otherwise would not be able to uh, live in because of no reliable surface water that we could could use. And then there's uh, that's kind of the spatial aspect, and the temporal is it um, it can help get us through droughts when uh, if we're relying on surface water. Sometimes are inadequate, and we can use groundwater. So it is really an important resource, as I'm sure you folks know from your experience there. Uh, now, some of the negative consequences um, when you pump wells and exploit an aquifer, you will have deeper groundwater levels, increased pumping lift. Uh, we've had areas in Arizona where um, the water table has been drawn down so deep that it's no longer economically feasible to to pump water from that depth uh, for safer use in irrigating crops. Um, and then you reduce the volume of groundwater storage remaining uh, under certain conditions. Uh, you could have land subsidence. Um, you can lose um, vegetation that depends on groundwater. So if you have areas where a very shallow water table and you have wetlands, um, you can lose that by drawing down the water table by pumping. And then um, reduce flow and water levels in connected surface water, such as streams, rivers, lakes, springs, things like that. Um, that's a fairly big issue, I think, worldwide. Um, reduce discharge to the ocean and coastal aquifers. Um, that's kind of an unseen effect. I don't, there could be some negative consequences of that. I don't live in an area with coastal aquifers, but uh, maybe some of you know about that. Um, but we do have a lot of areas in the U.S. where in the coastal aquifers, the, the pumping causes saltwater intrusion or maybe what we call up coning of saline water from deeper depths below the wells as you uh, pump a well. And um, our thought is that sustainability involves managing development uh, to keep these negative consequences at some acceptable levels over the long term. And again, that kind of involves society as a whole and not, not just the scientific aspects of it. Um, here's an example of groundwater use um, in the San Joaquin Valley in California, which is um, a very large percent of um, certain crops in the United States are grown there. Um, and originally it was irrigated with groundwater. This graph starts around 1960. And um, you see we're getting at that point, depth of water is almost 600 feet. So the pumping had really drawn down the water. And as a result of that, in that bottom graph, we're showing compaction in inches. Um, and that's yearly, yearly numbers. So um, eventually, um, maybe by the early 70s, surface water was brought in because this we had one place in the Central Valley where um, I think it was pretty close to, they had pretty close to 30 feet of land subsidence. But um, as you can see, um, 
the water levels are coming up starting at about 1970, but then we have this drought in the the late 70s and water levels immediately go back down by perhaps 150 feet. And associated with that, there's a, some additional land subsidence. Um, but then when surface water again becomes available, then there's a recovery, another drought period around 19, late 1980s, and then um, water level declines, some additional land subsidence or compaction, and then finally a recovery. But anyway, so this is an example of using groundwater to kind of get through droughts, but there are some negative consequences associated with it. Um, but maybe that's tolerable to help get through these these periods. Um, now, there's something that we call the water budget myth. I recall that um, when we talked about safe yield, we say it's often set to the amount of recharge that occurs. In, um, in an aquifer, but we we now say that concept is the water budget myth that the safe level of development is the amount of recharge because there could be a lot of negative consequences um, even at levels that are much lower than that, and instead of um, looking at how much water is being recharged, we need to look at how the effects of that development. And I would, the original concept by Bredehoff and his colleagues of the water budget myth was that um, you should look at how much of the outflow that can be acceptably captured. So if you have groundwater flowing into the aquifer and then discharging to some streams and wetlands and things like that, the effect of the pumping, and I'll be going into this more later, uh, is going to be how much of that outflow you can capture. I mean, would it be acceptable to dry up the, the streams and uh, the evapotranspiration areas that as one of the consequences, but there could be other consequences too, like land subsidence and um, drying up existing wells and things like that. Um, so to manage groundwater development, I'm sure Mark has been talking to you a lot about uh, developing a database and um, all this is going to be leading up to uh, developing a numerical model that can be used in the management. But um, So you need to know the aquifer framework, uh, the lateral and vertical boundaries, and um, what we would call the aquifer hydrogeologic framework, uh, what kind of clay layers you have. Is it a multiple system where you have connected aquifers? And then the actual hydraulic properties, like the transmissivity, hydraulic conductivity, storage coefficient of the aquifer, and also of what we call aquitards, which are the low permeability layers like um, clay and silt that are embedded in the aquifer. And then um, groundwater levels measured in wells, um, and that's something that has to be done continually over time. Uh, change in storage through time, um, we, we do that with gravity measurements. 
and then um, some rates of inflow and outflow to the aquifer, including how much wells pump through time and then recharge and discharge rates through time. So for these temporal data sets, um, a really long history is good. So um, the sooner you get started with that, the better. Um, and then assuming that you do have enough data, you have you develop a calibrated numerical groundwater model um, using this information. Um, it's always good to involve stakeholders in the development of the model. So if you have um, farmers or groups, municipalities that use the water, um, have them be a part of it, you know, update them on what's going on. Um, you'd represent the aquifer framework using layers of modeled cells that would represent physical rock layers. And then begin the model with a steady state pre-development condition using long-term average recharge and um, that would result in kind of an, a good starting point. And then you would um, have what we call a transient simulation period that could include time varying recharge and pumping. And then um, you calibrate the steady state and transient periods using things like water levels from wells in the database. And if you have any observed flows, like uh, how much groundwater discharges to streams, that would be important calibration information as well. Um, and then you kind of treat this model as sort of a living tool that's used and updated as new information becomes available. Um, it's always difficult when you're projecting into the future to um, know exactly what to put in for pumping and recharge, how that's going to uh, vary in the future. But um, you can sometimes um, make assumptions and see what the effect would be. Um, if possible, it's good to analyze the uncertainty in the predictions. Um, and then you can use this model to help guide a new data collection um, based on where, if you had data in certain areas, would it improve the model or not? Um, there's ways of doing that. And then if it's a really good model, you can do something called management optimization and try and answer questions like, um, you know, where is the optimal location for a new well or optimal pumping rate? And um, you can also, I've not gotten into water quality and contamination and things like that, but a good model would be a start uh, for those kind of analyses as well. Okay, um, I'm going to switch now to sources of water to a well, which is related to this to kind of understand what happens when you pump a well. So um, any groundwater hydrologist will know the name Tice because uh, he made the equation that we use to analyze aquifer tests. But he also observed uh, in a 1940 paper that when you pump a well, initially all the water comes from aquifer storage and then with time, 
the coronary depression spreads out to where there's uh, discharge from the arc, for, for example, like groundwater flowing to um, streams and rivers. And that drawdown reduces that outflow. And then it can also increase inflow rates um, by It can actually make, if you have a place where the stream is losing water to the aquifers, it can increase that loss. So actually the pumping is causing more water to flow into the aquifer. And then there's another concept where if the water table is right at the land surface, pumping a well creates some space for recharge to occur that wasn't there before. So we, we call that capture of rejected recharge. And I'll say that most capture is gonna be reduced reduction of groundwater outflow from the aquifer. And that's going to uh, affect the amount of stream flow. All right. So stream flow depletion is reduction in stream flow caused by groundwater pumping and capture, uh, increase in recharge plus decrease in discharge as I, I uh, said in the previous slide from using Tice's observations. Um, so in most cases, stream flow depletion is equivalent or nearly equivalent to capture. Um, and the way we represent this graphically is, I sure wish I could find the, I'll just try. No, but Helen Nishan was against because we are busy. You know, I'm busy. So you tell them already that I was busy. No, but I think it's. You have said you should understand when I said I was busy. How? Because you know. Sorry about okay, that. Okay, I did. I wasn't able to hear that. Was that a question? No, it was somebody that accidentally logged in as a presenter and was not muted by default. So please carry on. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, maybe you can see this arrow I have now. So um, when you first start pumping a well, this, uh, this curve up here says that 100% of the water is coming from storage in the aquifer and that's uh, either draining of poor spaces or uh, it could be elastic storage in the aquifer where water expands and the sediments contract or compress. But with time, as that Kona depression moves out, say to streams and rivers, maybe you have this capture or stream flow depletion which initially none of the water is coming from that. But if you pump long enough, all of the water is gonna be coming from stream flow depletion or capture and none of it from storage. This is what we call a new steady state condition. And then uh, we've marked these two curves where they cross it's kind of a, a point where on one side you have storage dominated supply, more than half the water's coming from storage. And on the other side, we have depletion do dominated supply where more than half the water's coming from depletion. And uh, we're kind of vague on this pumping time because this is 
highly variable. I'm going to show you more about that. Um, now, how do I get out of this? Uh, okay, let's see. It's not going. Page up and page down is not working. Can you use the um, new line button, see if it works? It was working. A new, a new line. Let's see. Am I pause? It might have something to do with the pointer. I'm sorry, what were you saying? I said it might have something to do. Did you use a pointer from the GoToWebinar tool or is that your? Yeah, I used the arrow from the, maybe you from the little side, side panel. Okay, so maybe this, maybe this allowed that error and then see if it works again. It might, it might be that because you have that error, it overrides your computer's ability to go up and down. Oh, here we go. Yeah, not in drawing mode. Let me do that. Oh, well, I went to non-drawing mode. Hmm. Let me see if I can. Okay. Now I got it back. Yeah, okay, so I'm back. Um, so this is our graphical representation, and it might be more complicated than this. So I'm showing the next slide. When you start pumping the well, uh, all the water is coming from storage change, but the corner depression may enter into evapotranspiration areas where you have plants that use groundwater and it could reduce the amount of water that those plants are using by lowering the water table. And then it could deplete stream flow. And then uh, as a uh, corner depression moves to a nearby stream. And then so the total capture would be the sum of these two curves. And um, at any given point in time, the total capture plus the total storage change equals one or 100% of the pumping rate. So we're accounting for all the water that's being pumped. It's either gonna be storage change or, um, or total capture. Uh, so this is, as I said, a really important issue in the United States. Um, here in the semi-arid Southwest, I would think that this, we have, um, this is where it's, this issue occurs, but actually it's a big um, problem even in the Eastern USA. Um, groundwater pumping is capturing water that would otherwise go to streams. Uh, so even in more humid areas, people are very concerned about this. Um, and they wanna protect the remaining riparian ecosystems. And then also the holders of existing surface water rights they don't want their flows reduced. So this is kind of a way that people can um, take water from streams um, without really um, having a water right. In a lot of cases, the, the groundwater laws are not sophisticated enough to recognize that pumping a well can take stream flow. Um, 
understand? So Sorry. you, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, it's just a logistic thing. I think your slides may be stuck on the on the source of water to well slide. So okay, if there is sources of water to a well. Yeah, so we are stuck yeah, on that, that one, which was the one that caused the problem. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can maybe um, stop the presentation and restart the, and, and then just go straight to that page. Um, or because it's not showing what you are seeing on your computer clearly. You're talking to, to a slide that we're not seeing. All right. Um... Oh, it says show screen is paused. Okay, let's try that. Freeze on last screen. Now, it says it's showing my screen now. Let me see if... But now it's not going forward. Wow. If he, it's it is still on the on that same slide. So I don't know if it's more worthwhile to close the presentation and restart it and just go to straight to the Okay, I could do that. I think that that's easier. Thank you. All right. Okay. I guess I won't try that arrow anymore. That seems to cause problems. Are you seeing the... Um... We're seeing the presentation again. Yeah, and now you're moving for the slides. Thank you. Yeah. This is where we were stuck. That's where we were stuck. All right. All right, and uh, I think I described this one, but you didn't see it. Um, I was saying you could have multiple places where water could be captured from evapotranspiration or stream flow depletion. And then the total capture would be the sum of those two. And this total capture plus the storage change are always equal to the well pumping rate. So those were kind of the points there. Then I was discussing that this is an important issue, not only here in the south, semi-arid southwestern U.S., but even in the more humid areas, um, people are very concerned about this issue. So the um, kind of progression uh, graphically is that without a well pumping, you would have recharge to the aquifer to the water table and then water discharges to the stream. <coughs> Excuse me. At some point, if you in introduce a well, You lower the water table, you take water from storage, but you may still have the same amount of water discharging to the stream because the Kona depression hasn't reached the stream yet. And then at some point, 
you may reduce that gradient to the stream as the corner depression goes out. So you have uh, captured groundwater discharge of the stream, um, but you, you may still have some discharge of the stream, just not as much. And then um, if you have really high pumping rates or the well is very close to the stream, it's possible to reverse that gradient to where now you're actually drawing water from the stream. Um, and this is a more extreme case uh, that we call induced infiltration of stream flow. Uh, the factors that affect the timing are the geology, the aquifer dimensions, the size of the aquifer, hydraulic properties like diffusivity, which is transmissivity divided by the storage coefficient, the boundary conditions where you might have no flow boundaries or other things that affect the change in head. A well location, the, how far it is from the stream, both vertical and horizontally, and the pumping schedules, how often you pump and that sort of thing. Uh, to show you um, some differences in timing, this is in our smallest state, Rhode Island, a fair a very small basin called the Hunt River Basin. And um, it's just a handful of miles wide and maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15 miles long. And there's a few wells that we have shown here. And um, this is the stream flow depletion calculated by a groundwater model for these three wells. And notice that the time on this graph is in, measured in days, like uh, the whole graph is covers about a year. So within about a year, if you pump any of these wells, essentially all the water being pumped is coming from stream flow depletion. So it reaches this new steady state condition fairly rapidly. Now contrast that with out here in the southwestern USA, we have this basin that kind of starts in Mexico and flows to the north into the USA. This also with the groundwater model, we have these two hypothetical well locations. One is actually uh, fairly close to the river. And one is maybe about six or seven miles away. And um, here we measure time kind of more on the decadal scale schedule and we like this well B which is further away if it pumped for a hundred years you would just barely get half of the pumped water coming from capture of surface water and even well A which is fairly close probably within a mile or two of the stream. It doesn't um, reach a steady state in this 100 year period. So there's a big difference, um, especially the size and the distance from the pumping well to the stream control the timing of that capture of surface water. Uh, one thing we've done is made something we call a capture map. This is for the San Pedro Basin. And um, what this particular one says that if you pumped a well for 10 years, this would give you the percentage of the well pumping that would be coming from captured surface water. 
So if you were in this dark blue area and you pump for 10 years, less than 10% of the water would be coming from captured surface water. And if you pumped for um, in this orange area, for example, it might be more like 70 to 80% of the water would be coming from captured surface water. So, um, this has been a valuable tool for people to use to understand the timing of capture. And uh, I'll just say that in this particular basin, it's kind of one of the last remaining desert streams that doesn't have any dams on it. And it's got a riparian trees by the river that's uh, good habitat for birds. It's kind of a internationally known birding area. And so the people that live here in the town of Sierra Vista, I think for the most part, want to see this river preserved. They don't want to see it dried up because of groundwater pumping. So this is kind of um, what I was referring to earlier is maybe a societal effect of um, people deciding what's important for their area. So on the other hand, groundwater is their only source of water in this space and they don't have any reliable surface water supplies. So um, they're doing all they can to reduce the amount of water they use and to make use of um, water that returns that's not consumptively used in their houses and businesses and things like that. So that's very important. It's a good example of uh, kind of people caring about their, their resources that are related to groundwater. Um, so the scientists and engineers we can kind of make our models and tell you what factors are important that might affect stream flow in any given area, uh, dispel myths and conceptions that people might have about groundwater pumping, um, provide monitoring, field studies, and modeling to determine the rates and locations and timing of capture by groundwater pumping. And uh, I guess this is my last slide right here. Um, if you are interested in this topic of stream flow depletion by wells, we have this uh, circular 1376, um, which again, you could find on the internet Essentially, all USGS publications are are online. So um, this kind of covers this topic in a lot more detail. So that's essentially what I had for you this morning. Um, I don't know. Do we have time for questions or discussions? Yes, thank you, Stan. We do, but before I open the floor for questions and discussions, I would like to give the word to Mark from USGS, who is basically our um, connection between the Big Data Analytics and Transboundary Water Management Collaboration with Southern Africa and USGS, um, because he wasn't able to join us at the very beginning. So, Mark, the floor is yours. You wanted to say a few words on the presentation, and Stan, thank you. Mark? Mark? Mark?
I wonder if I could send him a message. I was actually thinking the same. Um, let's let's carry on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess we could open it up to anyone else. Dan, yes, uh, before we open it up to the floor, I just wanted to say thank you to you for rescheduling this, this training and for providing us with this insight on your experience and also the approach, which I find very interesting coming from a sustainable development perspective, you know, and how do we merge the goals of water management with providing still the opportunity for human development? And how do we use a sustainability framework to make sure that we don't compromise um, the water sources that we have, uh, not just in terms of pollution, but in this case, in, in the sense of extraction. And um, I think that for our research teams, this is also very interesting, especially looking at your last slides and what is the role of scientists in making sure that we take up the sort of past research that has been done and past experience that has been done and make it ours and provide good insights in different other locations of the world and specifically for us in southern Africa all of our projects are working in the Ramotswa aquifer which is between South Africa and, um, and Botswana so um, yeah I, I, I would like to thank you very much for this and I would like to open the floor to see if there's anybody who would like to make a comment on the presentation provide uh, insight from their own work or uh, simply ask questions to Stan. Anybody brave? Um, I heard I heard from Mark. He says he can't get his mic to work. Oh, shame. Yeah. That's, that's problematic. Yeah, because I can see that he's is he's, he's not muted, so he's definitely able to talk. Okay. Yeah, I, I went with the phone. I just thought it would be more reliable. Thank you. I'm going to unmute Kevin Peterson, who's the research team leader for our project uh, in the Ramatwa and the Shira River, so he can ask the question as he's got a raised hand. Thank you, Kevin. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the, for the fascinating presentation. As, as sustainability is something that, that we, we struggle um, continually, you know, in terms of trying to understand. One of the biggest issues that we have is time. And, and, and for example, I'm now dealing, uh, you know, around conflict between farmers, mines and, 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 and municipalities in terms of exploiting um, cost aquifers. And, um, you know, as hydrogeologists, we, we, we kind of define or talk about 10, 15, 20 years time. Um, but, but, but normally in those type of conflict situations, we don't have time to make, to, 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 to make the decisions that needs to, to, that needs to be made. So the question goes around, you know, how do you get to a point of, of trying to define acceptable trade-offs between, between the, the various uh, parties and how do we deal with, with this whole time issue. We, we don't have the time to do the modeling studies. We don't have the, the time to, to do all the studies necessary to support our decision making. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, to what level <laughs> Excuse me, you, you've had those kind of experiences where you're dealing with multiple stakeholders with, 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 with expectations. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, an issue that we all ha have is, um, uh, as I understand it, you're saying you don't have the time to, uh, say, collect uh, a long data series or to put together analytical tools is that right um, yes that that is uh, that is correct and and what I'm trying to get uh, to is you know how do you start defining what what is acceptable trade-offs between the various parties and how do you move forward 
together in a partnership um, as as opposed to a conflict situation that that normally um, um, results. Yeah, this is almost. Uh, um, well, here um, some of those aspects would be at the uh, state level. So groundwater management is done really at the state level. And the USGS provides kind of some technical support like databases um, of say surface water flows and groundwater levels and things like that or uh, well well databases and then some states have their own databases so here it's kind of a hodgepodge and some I think so you might go to some areas of the U.S. where, you know, that not much has been done because, uh, you know, like you say, it, take, it takes time and money. So um, I think you just have to start with whatever you can do. Um, uh, I'll admit that this kind of developing these databases and things like that is probably where you're at. It's it's not so much my expertise. <clears throat> it would be good if Mark could chime in, but I don't think he's able to yet. Um, we have... Although a, I wonder... Sorry, Stan. I we, wonder if he... I'll, I'll, I'll do get, you have it? I'll, I'll, I'm trying to get Mark. So... Um, I am trying to see if we can chat. But in the meantime, there is another question from Helen, who's a team leader for our um, team four. And she has a question that might be actually a follow on to um, Kevin. So I'm going to unmute Helen so she can ask the question to you directly. And then we can start a discussion on what happens when we have no data or very limited data. Oh, OK. So Mark is also here. Um, so let me just unmute Helen, and then I think we can have the conversation with Mark after she asks the question. Okay, thank you, Helen. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. I, yes. Thanks, yeah, thanks. I really enjoyed the, the presentation, and I uh, very much enjoyed the Ali and Leak 2004 paper and referred to it many times. Um, and we actually have referred to it in our uh, in our current work on this project. Um, we're specifically looking at how we can um, kind of quantify those elements of capture and estimate the future dynamic equilibrium, uh, possibly using big data analytics or, or different approaches rather than our kind of standard numerical groundwater modeling. So we're looking at whether we can use artificial neural networks or machine learning models for estimating kind of those elements of capture. And I wonder if you have any experience in that. And specifically, our concern is that uh, the artificial neural networks are not going to be particularly good at long term future um, future predictions or predicting things that aren't seen in the training data set. I wonder if you have any experience with that. Um, I haven't done anything like uh artificial neural networks but um i am familiar with you know analytical solutions for for mm -hmm. capture and um i also try and um uh, steer people towards um something called superposition or change model so you can make like you may not have the time or the funds to make a calibrated numerical model but you could do something called a change model that incorporates the geometry of the system for you know so there's a lot that we don't know about an aquifer but the geometry especially on the surface 
is one thing we do know very well. You know, we know where the rivers are, you know, that are connected to groundwater, and we know where the uh, wetlands are and things like that. Um, so uh, something that's very cheap and quick to do is um, a change model or a superposition model. Um, and they're usually not calibrated. They're kind of hard to calibrate. But um, the one good thing about this is that of all those factors that I mentioned that affect the timing of capture, the single most important one is the distance from the well to the stream. So in the analytical solution, that distance term is squared, whereas, say, transmissivity and storage coefficient are just to the first power. So um, the thing that you know the best is happens to be the most important. And um, I've done actually quite a bit of uh, superposition modeling along the Colorado River to look at um, which wells would be getting their water from the river that don't have a contract for water in the river. Um, and I could provide references to USGS reports on that. And um, uh, the analytical solutions themselves are can be handy, but you know they're restrictive. Uh, the, you know the to geometry of a straight river and uh, aquifer boundaries have to be you know ideal for the analytical solutions to to really be correct, but they can still be useful. I don't want to discourage you from using them, but um, um, I've made capture maps using superposition models. Um, I have some of those in report, USGS reports, if anyone's interested. Um, yeah, I mean, that, if you could share those with me on email, then I can put them up onto our group on LinkedIn and our um, Google Drive so that we can have them as reference sure. for the project teams. That would be great. Sure. Thank you. Sorry, the geometry uh, part um, you referring to, is that related to the evapotranspiration modeling that Gabriel and I talked to us about last week? No. Or is it something else? I'm just trying to understand because it's, it's for my own curiosity. Hello? Uh, was that for me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't see Gabe's talk. Um, so he's using. Um, satellite imagery and whatnot to uh, estimate evapotranspiration rates, is that correct? Yes, it did. It is. But he also yeah. mentioned something around, uh, like again, please bear with me, I'm not, an, I'm not an engineer nor another geologist, so I'm just trying to make sense of things in my head. Um, he also mentioned the question of geometry and using geometry to sort of triangulate and verify the information that one, get, one gets from about the transpiration. So I was just curious ah. what you were talking about with the to one of those elements of triangulation of information. Okay. So he's using the geometry of the ET areas. If I understood it. Yeah, yeah. If I understood it, um, <laughs> just bear in mind. Yeah, so with regard to, um, you know, what I'm talking about capture, so we're talking about a change. So he, he might estimate 
the overall rate of ET for a particular area. And, um, and then what I would be concerned with is how does that, how does a well pumping affect that rate? Because we know that the deeper the water table goes, then the, you know, the less will be transpired. Um, so, you know, we would use the rates that he would estimate and the areas that he would estimate, importantly, say in a model to, to calibrate we would try and simulate the right amount of water leaving the system at those locations. And then um, our models would try and predict how that would be reduced. Um, let's see, I'm not sure what more I could say about that. Um, oh, I just want to say that we have this very simple function that we use in most groundwater models where there's a linear relationship between depth of water and ET. So we say that when the water goes to a certain level, ET ceases. And then on the other end, uh, ET is at its maximum when water level is at a certain point. So we have this kind of piecewise linear function. So it's a very simple approach in our groundwater models that may not be strictly realistic. Now that may not be really linear, but we treat it as such, especially in our you know basin scale or more regional groundwater models. It's probably good enough. So, our approach is, I'd say, somewhat crude, and there are a little more sophisticated uh, ET packages for the models. That uh, there's one called Riparian ET that you could have, uh, uh, for instance, simulate anoxic conditions when the water level gets up into the root zone, then you start to kill off the plants. Um, real detailed studies of riparian areas, but um, anyway. Thank you, Scott. My, yeah. Hey, this this is Mark. Is there any chance you can hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Oh, right. How about that? <laughs> I'm using my phone now. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, Clara, do you want me to make a couple of comments finally? <laughs> yes, please, and then we're going to close. Otherwise, we're running out on our webinar time. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're going to potentially run out of power, too, huh? Well, anyway, I just wanted to uh, relate. First of all, I apologize for uh, not being... Uh, on the beginning of the call, I joined about 10 minutes later. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Stan, uh, kind of give a reintroduction. Uh, Stan is uh, one of the uh, intellectual powerhouses in groundwater in the USGS, and I'm so pleased that he was able to join us and uh, give some of, um, share some of his wisdom. I've taken a lot of classes in groundwater over the course of my life, but I learned more from working together with Stan over the course of 15 years, and I guess even longer than that. Uh, about how groundwater really works. And so I'm glad he was able to share some of his knowledge uh, with, with the team. I think a lot of these principles are really foundational in the sense that uh, when we start thinking about how do you make use of a, an aquifer, whether it's a transboundary aquifer or any other aquifer, you know, some of these principles need to be really considered as, as you begin to plan. Yes, it's, there's always a lack of data. Seems like going back to um, uh, Pearson's question, um, but understanding these principles can also help you understand 
you know, maybe you don't have the precise numerical answer, but at least you understand that, you know, for example, pumping even from a well that's a distance away from a stream can uh, eventually, in time, uh, affect the stream flow. So it, it, on sometimes a very valued stream like the San Pedro or uh, certainly every place has ecosystems that are highly valued. So again, uh, this will end up concluding our, our regularly scheduled series of, of seminars and uh, there may be more in the future if specifically requested, but all right now this is the last one we have scheduled and um, anyway it's ironic that i would have so much trouble on the last one but um, anyway <laughs> uh, anyway thanks to to stan thanks clara for making the organization happen um i'm not sure what else to say at this point with only a couple of minutes left about the complex principles of groundwater but i think these are very foundational and I'm glad we were able to cover them, Stan, and thanks for getting up so darn early down there in Arizona. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. I'm glad to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Stan and Mark. I think what we can also say is that you, we're going to organize another USGS travel to Southern Africa, where hopefully there will be a face-to-face -face seminar with you, Mark. So hopefully next year that will happen, and we'll work towards making that happen. In the meantime, um, we're going to share with all the people who participated in this seminar a form um, to ask us for opinions and suggestions to improve our series of webinars as we prepare for the IBM Research Africa crash course on big data analytics and then possibly another course on transboundary water governance next year. So thank you everybody, thank you to USGS for this first um, trial of, of webinars that we've had and seminars and uh, thank you to everybody who attended over the course of the past three months. I wish you all a good afternoon and for those of you in South Africa, watch out for the load shedding. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.